Rob Malazzi, uh, thanks so much for joining me today or for having me here at SMC uh, Lavalin. My pleasure, my pleasure. So you're director, program director for uh, retubing, maintenance, and inspection? Correct. Here at SNC Lavalin. That's correct. It's a long title. It is a long title. And I was going to ask you, you're from Italy. What part are you from? <laughs> so my, yeah, so my, my ancestry is Italian. Um, my, uh, uh, I uh, didn't grow up there. Uh, I visited quite often as I was growing up. And I still have a ha family home in Tuscany. So oh, I, I frequented Tuscany as, uh, as I was growing up as, yeah. a, as a youngster. That's awesome. Yeah. And so where did you actually grow up? I grew up not far from here in Toronto. So on the okay. west end of Toronto, that's where I uh, that's where I really grew up. And you yeah. studied mechanical engineering in your undergraduate. Yes, I studied uh, mechanical engineering at uh, McMaster University, which is just uh, nearby as well in Hamilton, Ontario. Cool. And I, then, uh huh. I, and I continued on to do a master's degree in mechanical engineering okay. as well. Okay. Why a master's? Yeah. Well, so I was exposed to um, uh, some of the research that was going on in the laboratory uh, while I was doing my mechanical degree. And a lot of it had to do with nuclear steam generators and mm. uh, some of the technology that was actually being investigated in the nuclear industry. And I thought it was pretty exciting and thought it'd be something pretty neat to, uh, uh, to pursue. So yeah. um, I was approached by one of the professors and we had a discussion and uh, I thought it'd be the right move for me to kind of go on and do a master's degree. And yeah. uh, you know, instead of working, do something fun for, uh, for a couple of years. A little bit more yeah. relaxed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. I really enjoyed those, uh, those couple of years doing a master's degree. Yeah. yeah. So in your undergraduate as a mechanical engineer, you were just exposed to nuclear because of the research that correct. was going on at McMaster. That's correct. A lot of our projects and a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the background to our assignments had to do with the research that was going on at the mm -hmm. university. Um, and is that do you think because the nuclear industry is so large in Canada or why were they so connected? Well, at the time, um, there was construction and testing going on of, of reactors in the province of Ontario. Um, we had a big presence in Ontario as well with uh, Atomic Energy of Canada and the nuclear laboratories that were doing testing. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of the research that was going on was dealing with the problems that we, uh, we were trying to, um, to correct or enhance uh, some of the issues, uh, some of the performance of the reactors uh, in Ontario. Yeah. So it was, um, it, it was you know, a pretty good, a good spot to be if you were nuclear. And the, the university itself did have a small nuclear reactor. And, oh, it did. And a very good engineering physics program. So cool. What kind of a reactor? Does. It's a pool bed type reactor. It still exists. Uh, they still use it um, yeah. at the university. Did you yeah. get to test it out when you were at university? No, just tours. I was a mechanical yeah. guy. I wasn't oh, engineering yeah. physics. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so you ended up doing research. And then didn't you go work for Atomic Energy of Canada? I did. I did. So I, uh, I joined in uh, 20 years ago. Actually, this month. Wow. Yeah. Oh, congrats on the anniversary. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I joined. I actually walked into this building here. Uh, 20, 20 years, years ago. ago. Yeah. How does it compare to yeah. now? Is it bigger it's, now? It's, uh, well, same size. Same size building, but it's a lot more modern now than it was back then. Yeah. Yeah. And so take me through the progression of your career. Where did you start off as? So, so I actually started off um, uh, prior to joining AECL. Um, I, I did a small stint on uh, working on steam generators, mm. nuclear steam generators and stress analysis in, 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 that, in that world. And then an opportunity came up uh, at AECL to, to join the field services um, team. So um, I, uh, I jumped on that opportunity. I thought it'd be really exciting to you know, go into the field, perform inspection and maintenance on the, uh, on the reactors, uh, do any repairs. And, uh, and I was right, it was, it was great. I did that for the first decade of my career. Yeah. Um, I traveled to all the can-do sites. Um, I led a lot of the teams performing inspections and repairs, first of a kind issues we had to solve in the field. Um, and it was, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was a great experience in terms of understanding the problems that the industry faced mm -hmm. and how we dealt with them and how we corrected them and we made the, uh, um, we, you know, we, we contributed to, you know, the performance of the, of the reactors. Um, but also, you know, how we have a really systematic approach to problem solving in the industry and we don't mm. just rush into things. Yeah. Right? We take a step back and, and, um, and we're very uh, methodical in our, in our ways of uh, dealing with issues. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to pick your brain a little bit about the different kind of issues you saw because sure. you're talking about actually, you know, being on the floor in a plant mm -hmm. and dealing with maintenance issues right there on the right. spot. 
Right. So what were some of the biggest issues that you'd see or, you know, the recurring issues that you'd see in different plants? So a lot of the issues we dealt with were the replacement of components that initially weren't designed to be replaced. Hmm. Right. So we would have uh, components that looked to be maybe degrading. Mm -hmm. uh, the materials were um, maybe not going to last the life of the plant. So we would proactively say, okay, how are we going to get these components replaced? How do we replace these? They were never designed to... To, to, to be replaced, at least by humans. Right? Yeah, so why w why isn't every part in a plant designed to be replaced at some point? Well, so, I, I mean, our, our reactors are designed, um, in a sense, or at least they're, they're capable to be replaced, to be refurbished mm -hmm. at a certain point, and we do that. That was the next phase of my career when I went into the, re the refurbishment bin. Um, but, you know, you, um, you, you design things in a certain way with the understanding that the materials, the integrity of those materials, and the pedigree that you've got uh, that goes into the quality program will um, not require you to replace those components. Hmm. And if you really did, it'd be really, really hard. Yeah. But it would be such a very minimal risk. Um, unfortunately, you know, sometimes those risks uh, come to the forefront through analysis and we say, you know, there's the, there's the, the margin here is decreasing. It'd be, uh, it'd be a good idea if we could look at swapping these out or replacing these. Yeah, yeah. and so what were some of the parts that were not meant to be replaced, but you... So in the can reactors, we have the feeder piping. So okay. these are the, uh, d depending on the reactor design, uh, each side of the reactor has, you know, 380 to 480 fuel channels. And each fuel channel has a, a feeder that's attached to it that goes up to the headers. So these feeders could be nested behind each other. You could have, you know, several rows of these things. Mm -hmm. And and initially, um, you know, uh, approaching that, you, some you can hardly reach with your hands in terms of, of getting your hands on them. Wow. Um, so that that would be one component. The others are the fuel channels themselves. Uh, so these are the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the main core of the reactor that contains fuel. Mm -hmm. um, we've had to replace those components. Um, uh, I mean, now it's uh, it's an everyday occurrence uh, in the sense that on the retube projects, we, re we, we, we routinely remove the whole reactor and reinstall all these fuel channels. But there was a point in time where um, uh, doing that activity was, was something new and novel. We had to come up with the tooling and the systems to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And and we're still mm -hmm. um, elaborating on those tooling systems and improving on them and coming up with easier, uh, safer, better ways to do that. Because the less time we spend in front of the reactor phase performing maintenance with humans, mm -hmm. uh, the better off we are in terms of the amount of dose people would pick up and the overall general safety of the, of the operation. Yeah, that's interesting yeah. that you focus on the safety aspect because I was thinking of the because you don't want to shut the reactor down for so many days. Right. Then you're not producing power or yeah, isotopes. So, or. Yeah, well, I mean, we always hold safety in, in the forefront, especially yeah. when we're, um, we wear the boots on the ground. Uh, right. Uh, you, I mean, reactor safety, of course, is, is super important when you're, when you're boots on the ground because you could do something that, um, that, you know, you could open up a system that's, say, not meant to be opened up, right? right. So there are so many, um, uh, so many safeguards around that that you know that we we really prevent that from happening but the actual human safety right keeping our workers safe um spending as little time as possible in front of the reactor face um in, in our inspection and maintenance work is is really something that we we have a, a keen eye yeah. yeah yeah and it's interesting i was just reading a book today and it was talking about some of the nuclear disasters and just about you know the people actually working on the ground mm -hmm. and dealing with you know, if I just accidentally splash this, I could really harm myself. And there's so many different ways to get injured in a nuclear facility. How did you feel going in to do maintenance and repairs or even just looking at a system? Were you ever nervous? No, um, I, I can't say I was ever nervous um, because there's, there's, there's so much rigor around uh, what systems are operating. Um, and just just to get into the reactor vault and go to your work location, mm -hmm. uh, there there's there's quite the procedure and process to get there. Yeah, uh, you don't just kind of walk up one day and say, okay, I think I'll start working on this one system. Right. right. So it's all very well planned um, and and coordinated with the plant itself because it's it's an operating unit that's shut down for maintenance, um, but all of the systems are uh, in a known state and all of the um, shutdown. Uh, systems uh, are, are known. All of the um, uh, all of the systems that are shut down are are well known. Yeah. So it's it's all coordinated between the work group. So myself coming showing up at the plant with my with my team mm -hmm. and the actual 
plant personnel who are, are, are controlling this, the state of the systems. Yeah. Yeah, I, I never felt unsafe working in those areas. That's no. good. Yeah. And I would think that coming from a mechanical background, at least for your first little bit of time working at the plant, you'd have to have some degree of trust in the people to, because you don't know everything about nuclear, right? You're a right. mechanical engineer. That's correct. So, yeah. and nuclear is very physics and chemistry based. It is. Um, we, we do go through some extensive training before we show up on site. Yeah. So tell um, me about your, what was your training like? Well, well we, we, I mean, we, um, we went through quite a bit of training in terms of what the reactor is, uh -huh. in terms of the components and the systems um, that make up the reactor. We also go through a very extensive safety training. So the company itself at the time, you know, we had a five day safety training course. Um, which focused on not just the nuclear laboratory that we owned uh, in Ontario, but also on um, the, the reactors that we would travel to for work. So it, it described the different zoning and the hazards and, and working in those environments. Yeah. And then of course, when you show up on site, they don't just uh, open the door and let you in. They, they have right. a, uh, a two to three day course where they go through all of the hazards working at the plant. It goes over things like locking out systems, tagging out systems, how to ensure your safety and how to you know ensure the plant safety and, and keep the reactor cool. Yeah. yeah. And then you were talking about you know some of the parts that you would notice the most that had to be replaced are the ones that maybe weren't built for that or that were hard to get to. Right. So what was the process for communicating that to other members of the plant and actually developing a way to fix those? Um, so so a lot of these issues you know they they really. Um, they're really well communicated throughout the industry. So it, it wouldn't be a situation where we'd get a phone call and uh, it would be like, you know, we, we, we want to replace this, this component. It would, it would really start with the inspections or the analysis that we were involved in as, uh, as the original equipment manufacturer and, and mm. the supplier. Uh, we would be part of the inspections of these components, um, which are, you know, required by our codes and standards. Um, Coming out of that analysis, we would get a heads up and we'd communicate to the plant that, you know, these components look like uh, they're, they're, they may not meet end of life as, as, we, as we believe them to. Which means um, like they'll go bad faster than you guys anticipated, essentially? Correct, yeah. Okay. They may not last a life. You may have to shut down the plant early okay. right, if you yeah. don't replace this component. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, it's um, you know, really a well, well understood type, um, uh, type of situation that we're, we're usually uh, in. Yeah. Um, and then we have um, some time to come up with, you know, the, the systems and the process to attack that, uh, that problem and, and, and come up with um, the approach that we're going to use to uh, replace that component, you know, safely and, and of course, expediently and mm -hmm. uh, try to bring that component uh, re replacement to uh, a better state than we found it. Yeah. Yeah. And you said you worked in this type of role for what ten years? For about ten years, yeah. That's a long time. Did it you is. did your skills get a lot better by the tenth <laughs> year? Do you think? I yeah. I mean, I I, I suppose my skills uh, improved. It, it was um, it's it, it was always changing in terms of the issues we would see and um, in terms of the experience we would gain from performing that that type of work in the field. Yeah. Um, whether it be you know domestically here you know in Canada or overseas, um, it was always a bit of a different job, and uh, and, and it was you know it's, it was pretty exciting, and um, I think it at first it it was more of a you know how do I fix a problem type job, uh, whereas towards the end of the ten years it became you know how do I lead these teams and how do I ensure that they're getting the message they have the right mindset to carry on what's what we've been doing for the past 10 years mm -hmm. without me right right you know um, who are the people that you know have the same mindset that have been through these problems gain the experience and have uh, uh, have the will as well to to, to continue and, and and do these jobs right yeah that's kind of where it where it turned, in, turned into around the, the the latter part of that decade right yeah turning it over to others who who can perform that work yeah, yeah, and training them and right. making sure they grow as you grow. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then over those 10 years, you said that you would work both here and abroad. Right. Did you? So it sounds like you worked on a lot of different types of reactors. Did you notice any types of reactors that were more prone to you know, need early maintenance? So we, uh, it, they were all the can-do design. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, they yeah. were all the can-do designs. <laughs> You're faithful to the can-do here. Yeah, yeah. They were all our can-do <laughs> reactors. Yeah. yeah. So um, some had, um, uh, I mean, they, they had varying issues um, uh, in terms of um, some of the problems we saw, you know, here in, in Canada versus overseas. Hmm. In terms of the, the feeder components I, I mentioned, right, we had, uh, we had to replace those here in Canada. Some of the overseas reactors didn't have the same issues. Why right? do you think it was that way? Um, I think that's still an unknown. Yeah. It may have had to do with the fabricating uh, processes, mm -hmm. um, chemistry, fine chemistry. There's so many different variables that go into it. Yeah. Uh, it's really difficult to, to, to peg. I, I think there are a lot of differing opinions on that. Do the systems here in Canada like the CANDU reactors here and the CANDU reactors abroad have the same monitoring system, so you're collecting the same data? Yes. Okay. Yeah, as far as, um, I mean, it's, in, in principle, they all have the, the, the same monitoring systems, yes. Yeah. And then in terms of monitoring, you said, you know, some might be, somebody would tell you the problems that were going on and then like one of the steps in the process is going and seeing that part and mm -hmm. validating it. Does it ever go the other way, where first you go and see a problem and then bring it to you know the control room or whoever you're reporting to, and then they see if the system caught it, or is the system set up so that it can really monitor every single part of the plant? No, I, I think the system is set up so that it, it can do the monitoring. Um, we will, uh, as part of an inspection campaign or inspection inspection project, mm -hmm. we'll go and we'll perform targeted inspections on the reactor. Okay. And and that will circle back to the plant where we pre we, we present them the results of that inspection. Yeah. Um, but um, that's that's pretty much the general way we, we find things. Is there yeah. like a set amount of time that you do an inspection, like every year? Yeah. There's um, th every every three or so years. Okay. We'll do an inspection. Um, yeah. d depending on the component, uh, depending on the reactor uh, itself. Um, there, there may be regulatory requirements that require you to inspect it more often mm -hmm. than not. Mm -hmm. um, so as a, you know, you may be inspecting every year for certain components, depending on the life of the reactor, uh, its history, and what the regulator would like to see. Do you? Is there a trend? Like, do you tend to inspect it more as it gets older? Yes. Yeah. Typically, that's that's the uh, uh, that's the routine. Uh, yeah. The older the reactor gets, uh, the closer it gets to its end of life. Um, the, you you want to monitor the reactor more frequently to, mm -hmm. to ensure that it's it's going to reach that end of life safely. And then, what is the typical end of life for a can do reactor? So, uh, in in general, you can say you know twenty five years is is the end of life, the end of the first life for the reactor. Mm -hmm. um, and then we go through a refurbishment or a retubing outage, where we can extend the life for another, say, 25 years. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I use that term. I use 25 years in general because it really depends on the amount of hours the reactor has. Um, but you know, that's that's the general um, the, the the general time frame. Right? How do you think that compares to other industries? Right, like coal plants and natural gas plants, and even mm -hmm. you know, a wind turbine or solar panels. Right. In terms of longevity and life, yeah, I, I really don't have a whole lot of uh, experience in those areas, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. terms of how long they, <laughs> how long they last, yeah. Yeah, I just wonder because at least in the U.S., a big conversation that we're having is that of lost assets because we're seeing a lot of our plants being decommissioned, right? And so we're having a lot of last lost assets in the nuclear field, mm -hmm. but then, you know, because wind and solar are so new, we haven't had to turn those over at all yet. Right. right, so we're still using the same wind turbines that we made seven years ago and the same solar panels, but we don't know what we'll do once we have to replace those. Right. You know, or how we'll discard those. So it's just... Yeah, so, you know, the Candu reactor was in a similar situation. Um, in terms of, um, we, we, we now have this, you know, pretty set refurbishment outage where we can operate the reactor for 25 or so years, refurbish it, and then operate again for another 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't really the original design intent to do that. Hmm. Um, we we initially replaced just the fuel channels in the reactor, uh, which is you know a subcomponent of the reactor in the 90s when we had some issues here in Ontario, and and we learned we we developed systems to do that to do that you know pick apart just this one piece of the reactor and put it back together. Yeah. Um, and and you know I think that really spurred the idea 
where we can actually um, replace more of the reactor mm -hmm. at the end of life, at the end of its first life, and then it can continue for a, another 25 years. Yeah. And about a decade or more after that, we, we did that. We did that here in Canada, in Ontario, in New Brunswick, and we did that overseas in, in Korea, where we demonstrated that you can actually replace the reactor core and all the core and the core components um, and uh, put the reactor back together and then it can go ahead for another 25 years and increase its longevity. So in, in terms of the other technologies, I, I don't know if they have that option. I don't know what you do for refurbishment or whatnot, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I can say that you know, for, for the CANDU design itself, uh, that was really an innovative, uh, some innovative thinking that went into, uh, can we replace this reactor core at first? And then, wow, can we replace, you know, like more than the reactor core to really ensure we can, we can extend its life and, and be satisfied that 25 years from now, yeah. uh, we can, we can uh, operate this reactor. Why do you think that it wasn't a thought from the beginning to just replace everything? Why did it take that gradual process? Yeah. I, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I wasn't around back then, obviously. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, I, th I think they were just uh, looking at what's the design life um, of a certain system and how do, we, how do we design a reactor around those certain parameters. Mm -hmm. um, now, there may have been some thoughts as to, you know, can you replace these components and whatnot, but we, we really had to innovate in order to uh, remove and reinstall components um, to be able to refurbish these things, right? So some of the technologies mm -hmm. that we use now uh, didn't exist back then, right? Right. Um, we really had to develop a lot of robotic technologies, for mm -hmm. instance. Yeah. Uh, we keep a lot of people out of the way uh, for safety reasons, of course, you know? Because of the radiation? Yeah, because of the radiation, you know? Yeah. It's always better to have a, uh, have a piece of equipment get irradiated than, than a human. Um, also for, um, you know, for or consistency and expediency, um, mm -hmm. We've come up with technologies to volume reduce the components so that mm. we're not putting, you know, large volumes of radioactive components uh, into casks and into long-term storage. We volume reduce them to bring the volume way down. Is that like melting them, or how do you so, volume? Uh, well, we have a we have a, a, pr a process where we actually uh, we we have a press that will crush. The, mm. the components and, and chop it into small little bits. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. And then it yeah. goes into dry storage, you said? It, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And that's so, just like stored on site? Uh, for for at, at present, yeah. Stored yeah. on site. Interesting. Yeah, stored on site. There I mean that that's one of the technologies we, we came up with in order to, you know, reduce the overall impact of retubing the reactor. Right. Um, we had to also come up with uh, uh, reinstalling components where you can't put a human inside the vessel. <laughs> because obviously it's uh, it's been irradiated now and you can't survive in there. So how do you test uh, the components when you can't have a human inside the vessel? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. guiding the component and, and performing you know a, a test on the integrity of that. So yeah. we've had to come up with our own uh, methods of testing those uh, and and satisfy ourselves that those are equivalent to or better than the original installed component and originally installed uh, original test to install that component and validate it. Yeah. So a lot of innovation has gone into into that to get us to where we are now. Yeah. With the retubing. Sounds like a lot of innovation in technology and maybe even like computer science. Right. Robotics to yes, get there. E exactly. That's a perfect yeah. answer as to why they didn't replace all those parts before. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you knew it. Yeah. It didn't really exist. <laughs> yeah. Back then. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. Okay. And so going way back. So you do your 10 years in you know actually doing maintenance and repair work and then right. where do you go from there so from there i um i landed in uh, new brunswick okay. to uh, support the refurbishment of the reactor uh, the candy reactor in new brunswick um i that that was my first entry into in, into retub retub really um uh, i was responsible for um looking after the installation of the new components and working with the new staff that we had uh, to the company at that point and having them, you know, just like I had to understand, you know, what, what does this reactor look like? Uh, what do these mm -hmm. components do? How are we going to be reinstalling them? A lot of what we did in, uh, in the field services world in terms of re replacing components applied to what we were doing on the installation of components on, mm. uh, on, on the retube with, with of course some, some variance because, um, uh, we're replacing the whole reactor core and we design systems in order to, to be more efficient at doing that. Um, so, so that's kind of where I, where I started out in, in the retube world. Um, 
And then I took a position looking after all of the systems that we had to retube the reactors. So mm -hmm. really process and systems engineering uh, to uh, remove, inspect, and install the, the reactor components. And that was more of a home-based position uh, here at head office where mm -hmm. we had a group of uh, engineers and technologists who were updating designs, uh, looking at innovations on how to improve designs, trying to understand well, what do we do with this equipment when it comes back home? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we refurbish the equipment itself and then send it off on a new campaign to go redo another reactor somewhere else. So you guys were actually shipping different parts, yes. different used parts around? Uh, the tooling system, yes. yes. Huh. Yeah. Why would you do that instead of, I guess if you could like paint the picture for me of what a retubing looks like from start to finish. Okay, so <laughs> that's a, I should have started there maybe, laid, <laughs> laid the groundwork on retubing. We'll just chop it in earlier. Into sure, the yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. So, so what we do when we uh, retube the reactor is we, we first install common systems around the reactor vault. So these are platforms, uh, tool control systems. So um, uh, PLC type logic control systems. What's PLC? Programmable logic controllers. Oh, so these okay. are the things that will control the servo drives that will actually perform the motions uh, on the tooling systems that we install. Um, we may install cranes. Um, we may install some temporary uh, parts to the plant in order to um, get the equipment in and out of the reactor buildings. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we install the actual tooling systems themselves on these uh, these um, generic systems. So the platform uh, would have a work table that gets installed, and on that work table uh, we have specific tools. We call them tools, or like um, they're automated systems that will go in and they'll perform a function. So it'll go in and it'll it'll, uh, it'll maybe cut a weld on the reactor. Another sy system will go in and it'll remove a component from the reactor. Mm -hmm. So all these little systems, right? We um, perform a series of work. Yeah. And the retubing of the reactor is cut into various little series. So, you know, about 30 or so series of work. Um, each series requires a system to do that. And right. these systems are being controlled by actual humans, but from a different location. That's right. So there's, there's a separate control room where humans will um, basically control the robotic systems that are located, you know, remotely inside the reactor building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and these, these systems are, um, uh, are not just used once, right? Uh, we, we design, we develop these systems. Mm -hmm. uh, say for the, a certain kind of design, they can be reused. Yeah. Um, for instance, we used the system in New Brunswick and in Korea, and we've interchanged systems there. We repatriated that system back, uh, back home, refurbished it, and then we redeployed it down to Argentina to perform the retubing down there. Okay, and yeah. do you do that because it's more cost effective or more time efficient, or what's the benefits? Um, well, it's it's definitely more cost effective. You're reusing a system. Um, it, it also allows us to, um, you know, not create something new in some cases. Sometimes the operating experience you have mm -hmm. uh, says, okay, this tool worked really well. Um, however, maybe we should make some fixes in this area because it say. It, it had a couple of breakdowns, and we or we need to replace these seals too often. Can we make a small design change? So you're you're really just tweaking things um, uh, to to improve them. You're taking the lessons mm -hmm. learned and the operating experience, and you're improving that system. And it has a it has a known track record, um, and and also it's it's a lot less expensive to uh, refurbish something and, and and ship it than to re, re to create something from new. And Do you have to retest it? Yeah. Do you ship them globally, or we is do. this more so just in Canada? Wow. No, well, we ship globally. What's the process for shipping something like that globally? I mean, um, how do you pack it up? <laughs> it, well, in, in crates, to, usually in crates and in shipping containers. Yeah. Um, of course, once they're once they're used in a reactor, uh, they're they're characterized depending mm -hmm. on uh, you know what kind of radioactive activity they have on them, um, and we use the we basically talk back and forth uh, to, to keep it simple. You know, we have our radioactive material shippers here in Canada, communicating with the radioactive material shippers, uh, say in Argentina or in Korea. Um, we may have to validate the characterization, so we may have mm -hmm. to fly there, fly someone there to validate, you know, how they characterize the equipment to ensure so like that. do a quick test on it, yeah, basically. Yeah, exactly. So when it lands here in Canada, it's a known entity, mm -hmm. and we can then re receive it here under our regulatory environment. Uh, we 
uh, we, we know what we're getting and, and we can manage it here. Does it have to be, I don't know, validated or regulated by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission? Well, it, it's all governed by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Um, uh -huh. so, um, so when we receive something here and we open it up in our, uh, our environment, we're opening it up under our site license. Okay. Right. So, so they, they do oversee what we do in our facilities. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Lots yeah. of moving parts to Lots that. Lots of moving parts <laughs> to it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just shipping uh, a system, you know, from Canada to overseas and back, isn't uh, isn't as easy as uh, filling out a UPS label and sticking it on a box. It's, yeah. It's it's a lot more complicated than that. Absolutely not. And so SNC Lavalin is responsible for that, or would that be like something that your customers do? Uh, well, we both have liabilities and responsibilities in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they, they set up that environment so that the shipper and the receiver both have responsibilities mm. and they're both accountable for, for certain parts of that. So you can't ship something to us unless our, uh, our, our RAM shipper, our, our radioactive material shipper knows it's coming in and, and accepts that shipment before it leaves the dock right. wherever it's leaving. Have you guys ever gotten one back with much higher radiation exposure than you'd imagined? Um, not to my recollection. Or, no. or on the contrary, much lower? Um, in some cases, much lower. That's a good question. I know we've, we've often um, opened, opened up a crate and there are various components in there mm -hmm. and there's a characterization of everything in there. And what we'll do is we'll we'll take one thing out at a time in our controlled environment, and we'll we'll do our own characterization on discrete components yeah. to see if we can actually um, use or perform work on that in a lower radiation area, mm -hmm. right? Just because it may be easier to deal with, right? But but, yeah. but typically, um, you know, the characterization is very well communicated between the parties, you know, ourselves and the other party. That it's not usually a whole lot of discrepancy. Yeah. And then before you go and you use it at a different site, do you have to say know the background radiation at that next site to see if you putting in something that's already irradiated will make the radiation levels too high? Um, no, it'll be kind of the inverse process. So it will be okay. where we refurbish something here uh -huh. and it has, you know, it, it may have some contamination, like fixed contamination, say, on it. And it's typically not that. Um, uh, not that significant uh, in terms of our retube tool set. Um, but we would have to, you know, disclose that, provide that assessment to the receiver at the other end uh, and say, this is what you're receiving. Yeah. But it wouldn't have an impact really on, on the work that we do once we get to site. Yeah. yeah. I have one last question on this. I don't know why sure. I find it so fascinating. <laughs> what do you do if you, you know, it, does it, is it significant if you get back a system that you've already used and say like there's a few missing parts? Oh, is it um, is it significant if there are missing parts? Yeah. <laughs> like, what we, would you do? <laughs> well, we, we, we often receive missing parts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we receive components with missing parts. Yeah. And and often what will happen is um, we may have our employees in the field, and they'll see a cable that'll be a common cable, and the cable may be uh, may have a lot of contamination on it, but the rest of the tool has barely any. Mm -hmm. So they may cut the cable off of that that tool. Ah, oh, that's right? interesting. Um, and it may be in the in the notes in the shipment, or it may be in some other document. But it's often a surprise when we open up a crate and we say, well, "Where's the cable?" And then <laughs> you have to go looking through the documentation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but normally, you know, with these shipments, things are pretty well documented. A lot of a lot of photographs are taken. We have thousands right. of photographs. I remember our first shipments uh, from say New, New Brunswick back to Ontario. It, it was just thousands and thousands of photographs we're going through because um, we were using those to help us assess, you know, what condition is the system in? How do we, um, how are we going to put it back together, right? What have mm -hmm. they done to it at site, you know? Uh, yeah. And, 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 and in, in many cases, you know, the optimal, the optimal uh, thinking was, well, those, the, the staff we have at site are going to return here and they're going to be the ones that refurbish the mm -hmm. system. But, um, you know, that may not have been the case because perhaps they were still at site doing work or we had to send them to a different site because of their experience. Right. So we had other uh, engineers and technologists assessing and performing the refurbishment on the tooling system. So photographs came in very handy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. You got me a lot to think about. I think this is like <laughs> a, something I've never talked about in an interview before, <laughs> shipping nuclear systems. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it seems like it's <laughs> or all nuclear subject. tooling systems. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so but we were talking about you set up basically the tooling station and some other components at the plant right. to re do the retubing. That's right. So, um, so we we set up the systems, you know, on these platforms and on these common equipment on this common equipment at site, and they perform their their actions um, on the reactor face, controlled by. Um, by our staff located remotely in, in control, in a separate control room, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we do have people in the loop when we are moving the components that we've taken out of the reactor, um, out of the reactor building, right? So we may volume reduce these components in the reactor building and put them into flasks or casks, um, or we may actually remove these components in a hole in a shielded container out to a building that will do the volume reduction, hmm. okay? Um, so at the end of the day, we've got um, components that are volume reduced in containers, and we have a tooling system that has been, you know, mildly decontaminated and boxed up uh, on site that has to be shipped off and refurbished. And then you have the old tubes. And yeah, so the old. Um, or that's what's been yeah, volume so, reduced. Right. So the old reactor components, mm. the 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 tubes we've taken out of the reactor. Uh, they've they've all been crushed and put into um, waste containers. Okay. Right. As well as the end fittings, uh, the feeders have been volume reduced to an extent as well. Yeah. And yeah. so, how many days does this usually take? It takes days, right? To refurbish the reactor. Right. Or um, months. Really depends on the project. Um, it takes uh, several months. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Eighteen to twenty-four months. Eighteen to, to twenty-four months. In that range, yeah. To perform. So two years. Right? About two basically. years. Basically. So this is like a nuclear plant shutting down for two years to right. get refurbished and then, but it doesn't start right back up after two years, right? Like it has to get tested before it goes into full operation or no? Um, well, so the, so the reactor is put back together in a sense, right? You know, we, uh -huh. we, we reinstall everything and we perform a lot of in-process tests as we're putting the components back together. Um, so, um, the the systems have to be recommissioned once mm -hmm. the reactor's back together. So once once we're all wrapped up with the fuel channels and all the components are back together, all the welds are done and 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 the reactor's back together, the tooling system gets removed. Um, that's when the systems get recommissioned. Yeah. Um, and that commissioning uh, and uh, and refueling of the reactor, of course, could take anywhere from you know three to nine months um, in in that range. That's a really long process. It's a long process. It is. Um, you could shut down the reactor after 25 years, though, right? So this is right. this is really extending. This is allowing you to operate for another 25 years or more. So what happens during that two years in terms of, let's say, you know, it's a nuclear energy facility or an mm -hmm. isotope facility? What compensates for that missing energy or the missing isotopes? Um, is that like coordinated on a larger scale? Yeah, I think it's it's more or less coordinated by the utility and yeah. you know here in Ontario by the Energy Board. They understand which reactors are going down for these refurbishment outages, and and they coordinate you know where the power is going to come from and, uh, and and those types of issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because now I'm thinking, I at least in the U.S. I don't know so much about how it is in Canada. You'll have to fill me in. But if we do want it deploy a lot of new nuclear in the same time era, then all of them are going to need to be retubed and refurbished around the same time. Right. So it's almost like going all in in nuclear right now means that in 25 years, you'll have all these refurbishments at the same time, and you'll have to figure out where to get your energy from during that period of time. Right. It's right. a big problem. <laughs> uh, well, it, it could be, yeah, it could be a problem. Um, um, so the way construction has uh, gone in Ontario is, um, you know, we, we didn't build all of our capacity, you know, uh, at the same time in one year. We built one unit at a time, and and that's how we're refurbishing the units. So, you mm -hmm. know, at, mm -hmm. at our, our plant uh, at, at Darlington, um, we're we're refurbishing one unit, then the next unit, then the next unit. Um, so we're not having to shut down all four units at the same time in in, in one part of the plant or all eight units, you know, at uh, at, a, at, a, at some other plant. Yeah, so it's good. So you're really strategically building new nuclear, looking at the whole lifetime of the plant. Right. And that, and well, that's how the refurbishment is going, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, um, we I, I've been in this uh, uh, on this campus for 20 years, right? So right. In, in 
in 2012, SNC Lava acquired uh, Atomic Energy of Canada. So I've uh, I've been here right through. Yeah. Did yeah. did that acquisition change much in terms of your job and your roles here? Um, in terms of my job and my role, no. I mean, we we still have the same mandate um, in terms of refurbishment of the reactors. Uh, in terms of the innovation uh, that we were mandated to do, you know, to um, improve the systems and shorten that duration uh, of refurbishing the outages, mm -hmm. refurbishing the candy reactors, uh, we still have that mandate. So, um, you know, the job really hasn't changed in, in that sense. Right? We still invest a lot of money in product development mm -hmm. to come up with innovations that are going to save time on these retube outages. And, yeah. and you know, even uh, you know, on on this day, where we're we're going through a, a design review, where um, we're we're developing a concept that will shave, you know, maybe about thirty to thirty five days off one of these retube outages. Um, cool. So, what what's this concept? What's this innovation? <laughs> well, what it is, I, I explained the series to you previously. The the retube series, we kind of cut everything into different series, and right now we're looking at can we combine two of these series together? Hmm. So that way, you know, two discrete series that'll take thirty days, you put them together. You do the same activity in in thirty days. Now you've uh, you've saved thirty days from that. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at many different innovations uh, to, you know, take time away from uh, from this retube outage because we don't look at the candy reactor anymore as a, a twenty five year asset. It's it's uh, it's at least a fifty year asset with mm -hmm. uh, you know plus whatever it takes to refurbish it in the middle. And if we can reduce that refurbishment time cycle in the middle. It, it really makes the business case a lot better for the reactor. Yeah. yeah. So how do you consolidate 60 days into 30 days? How do we consolidate it? Yeah. Well, well just, just like I mentioned, we, uh, we perform two discrete series now. And what we want to do is perform those two series at the same time. What would need to change to perform them at the same time? Well, so that's part of the innovation I talked about earlier, where we, um, we're developing new tooling systems that will um, that will, you know, say instead of removing one component, they'll have the capability of removing two components, say at the same time, mm. or shuffling around the process that we use to to make it more efficient, right? Okay. Um, maybe automate something or or automate some things together instead of performing one activity that's automated, you can perform several in, in the same sequence. How come previously it would be one thing is automated on its own? Mm -hmm. You know, why didn't you couple them earlier? So you know when we. When this whole process evolved, at, at first there was the whole, you know, person in the loop type concept where, mm -hmm. you know, we, we were going to start automating things, but we weren't so sure of ourselves. So we said, well, we don't want to have someone in a control room uh, on a joystick, you know, manipulating components in the reactor because we were a little concerned about how that would, how that would work. So we actually mm -hmm. put someone in the loop and we shielded all the equipment, right? Um, so a lot of the initial processes were kind of set at that point, where you have somebody on the reactor face, um, kind of operating a tool with a pendant, watching the thing move, and it's all very small, discrete events that would happen uh, on the reactor face. So and it's because like a person is doing it, so you want them to sort of do one thing at a time. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And then we evolved to where we are today, which is you know we have control room and things are really automated. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we, you know, the, the level of automation is increasing. We're looking at this thing. Okay, well, how much more can we automate? How much more can we do uh, to save time and 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 pull pull this time out of the outage and be more efficient? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like automation? How do you feel like automation plays a role in safety? Like, is it safer to have more automated systems, or do you think it's safer to have a human behind those systems? Um, I I think we've made the case that automating. Um, a lot of our processes will will make it safer overall. Mm -hmm. um, this this one you know scenario that we're looking at would reduce the amount by by automating and by removing components together instead of discreetly. We're actually eliminating uh, like a thousand lifts of heavy flasks in the reactor building. Oh wow! Right? So just just by eliminating that on the project, that's that's a thousand events where you need to hoist and rig. And hey, you have humans in the loop, mm -hmm. so it's taking that out of the equation. Yeah. So to me, that that really improves the safety of, on a project, right? Just one mistake mm -hmm. in rigging, uh, or, you know, could, could could be devastating to to the humans and to the project, right? Yeah. Um, so if you're taking out a 
thousand lifts. You know, that really, to me, has an impact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then in terms of testing these, where do you test them? And okay, so um, that, that's a good question. We uh, we've had many evolutions of, of mock-up facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ontario, we have, I think, right now, which is probably the best mock-up facility for a can-do reactor. Um, it, um, it, it really simulates uh, the full reactor core, in a sense, and, and when you walk into the reactor building. So we, we do full mock-up testing with the components, um, with, uh, sorry, with, with actual reactor components, um, with our actual tooling systems prior to um, deploying the systems or the people into the reactor. So That's all the cool. training, testing, systems are all integrated before we, we deploy these systems into the field on this full-scale mock-up. So do you do the test like one innovation at a time um, in addition to doing, say, you say, okay, there's five new ways that we're able to do the that we're able to incorporate into the entire process. So mm -hmm. now we're going to run the entire process as a test with those five new changes. Um, in a sense, yeah, we that's what we would do. I mean, we it really depends on where we are with the innovation mm -hmm. and when we're going to going to inject it into the project. So l let's say we had three innovations and we we wanted to put them in, into the project. Well, we're not just going to do that. We're we're going to go through our design process and. We're going to, um, you know, um, finalize the design, build these things. We're going to test them all individually, and ensure that they meet the requirements and they all interface well with the systems that that we've already got. Um, and then we'll uh, uh, perform integration testing, where we integrate them with the rest of the system. Mm -hmm. um, all of that is, you know, offline, just to make sure we'll we'll cycle test it. We'll make sure we're um, we're meeting the requirements and everything's doing what it's supposed to do. And then at that point, we say, okay, it's time to move it to site. It's time to train the resources with the system. Um, time to incorporate the procedures into, uh, into you know, the, the entire workflow, into all of our work packages. And then it gets flowed into the project that way. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that this isn't really, I, I don't think it's like your field of expertise per se. But to me, talking to you, it sounds like there's such a mix between the different disciplines here. Like it's so important to have mechanical engineers mm -hmm. working with nuclear engineers and systems engineers. So how do you see the future of nuclear engineering changing based on um, you know, education and the majors that students are going to be enrolling in in the future? Hmm. Well, I mean, we, we've seen a lot of um, programmers and a lot of people that you know, program computers yeah. And deal with this programmable logic control system that we've, you know, that we we have integrated with all of our systems. Um, I think there's going to be a real uh, a real increase in you know the amount of that skill set that's that's needed to 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 support our our systems in general. Yeah. Right? Um, I mean, there's always the um, the people who can, you know, come out of say a mechanical or an electrical or even a civil discipline. Uh, who will will be able to pick that up and get good at it? And we've seen that it's it's, it's mm -hmm. incredible, you know, how people can adapt and they, they their minds can just pick things up. Uh, but you know, when you when you look at you know where we're headed with our systems uh, to inspect and to maintain the reactors and to refurbish them, mm -hmm. I think you know that we're we're really getting into the world of automation and uh, logic controlling, logic control programming. Uh, that's that's really where we're headed. That's pretty cool. Mm. And then I don't think that we ever mentioned it, but the main reason that you do retubing, is that because of the corrosion that happens in a plant and like the wearing down of the material? No, so it, it's actually because the reactor grows, uh, to be honest with you. Grows? It grows, yeah. So our, our fuel channels um, are, uh, are, are, are made of, you know, uh, zirc niobium uh, material as it gets irradiated. Uh, the pressure tubes actually grow. They sag and they grow, they elongate. Mm. Oh, they so fly. they were only designed to um, uh, to grow a certain length so that they would remain safely on the bearings of the fuel channel. So if they grow too long, they go off bearing and it's not a normal condition. Yeah. So as they start to grow and grow too long, we say, okay, it's time to uh, replace these, uh, this reactor. Yeah. Crazy. So predominantly that's, that's, the, that's the reason we, uh, we, we retube. Yeah. How is this growth measured? Is it like a continual reading every day that you guys take? Or uh, well, there there are several um, 
measurements that are taken, you know, with the, the fueling machines that will latch on to the fuel channel. As part of our inspection programs, uh, we, we measure the actual length of the channel, the length and the sag of the channel. Hmm. Um, periodically, we'll do that to, to keep that monitored. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. There's so much chemistry involved in nuclear, like just and material science, I guess yes. I'd say, right. rather than chemistry. That just amazes me. Mm -hmm. Things that I think most people would never think about. Yeah, everyone's very surprised <laughs> when I say that our reactor grows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that should be like your opening line <laughs> about your job. Yeah. And so now in your job, in your day to day, are you still very hands on in, in the engineering of it? Or are you more in that managerial position helping the engineers? Uh, well, a bit of both. I mean, I, I look after um, you know, our, our retube division staff and our inspection and maintenance system staff. Um, uh, we, 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 we continue to develop systems. Um, we, we continue to design and support these systems uh, in, in the field. So for, for me personally, you know, I'm, I'm involved in the design reviews for these. Uh, I contribute in, in, in that aspect. Um, I ensure that you know, our, our design processes are, are sound and the way we're designing things uh, makes sense and, and that everyone is well trained and well versed in, in, our, you know, in, in the rigor that we put into our design process. Yeah. Um, I also love to get down into the, you know, into the field, into our laboratory, uh, you know, almost daily if I can, just to, you know, see the equipment, see the tooling, um, and talk to the staff and understand, you know, what issues are happening are happening and help solve them. So yeah. I still, I mean, that's that's really my passion, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that laboratory is huge. I wish I had time to tour it, but how many <laughs> how many people work in the lab and like how many projects do you guys have going on right now? Well, that's that's, that's hard to say how many people work in the lab. Um, uh, I mean, I, my, my staff are in the number of about 215 and about more than half of them reside in that lab. Yeah. Uh, the other half are in the field working on, on projects. Um, so I, I would say we have maybe 150 people, you know, between yeah. those that report through me and, and other SNC lab employees, uh, mm -hmm. are, are working in that lab, you know, supporting the, uh, the the environment there with the machine shop, uh, all of the um, uh, all the other assembly areas that we have. Yeah. yeah. And how many projects do we have going through the lab? Was the second question. Yes. That's a really good question. I, <laughs> many, many, many projects. They're not all under your division. They're not all under my division. Right. No. Under right. your division, how many projects would you say you have going on right now? So, we would have you know probably around. 30 or so projects on the go right now. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah and, and and they would, um, I mean, they could be, you know, the large refurbishment projects that we have on the go, um, or they could be smaller um, inspection contracts that we have to go and, and perform inspections on on reactors, um, uh, or or even some contracts to refurbish tooling, uh, design tooling, design scope as well. So um, we do a lot of inspection tooling, so we'll, um, will design, integrate, uh, and deliver inspection tooling to go, you know, do inspections in radioactive environments as well. Hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like through all of this work that you've done in nuclear, because I mean, it still seems like you're such a mechanical engineer and you're very on the mechanical side of it, but have you developed like a really staunch support of the nuclear industry or are you sort of indifferent to it or how do you of, feel? Of the nuclear industry itself? Yeah. Oh, I, I think from day one, I've, I've always uh, supported the nuclear industry. I've always wanted to be part of it. You know, ever since yeah. going back to, you know, when I decided to go and, and, and do my master's degree, um, you know, just, just to be around the issues that were in the nuclear uh, industry and, and to understand the problems that uh, they were facing, um, you know, it's really you know, it's just been a passion of mine ever since, that, since those days. Yeah. So I'm definitely a supporter of the nuclear industry. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And what do you hope for it in the future? I hope it grows. Um, I, you know, I, I hope public understanding of, of nuclear uh, increases. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't think um, the public understands that the technology as well as the public should understand the technology. Right. Yeah. There's all this. There's this fear. You know. I, I think in some, uh, you know, in, in some areas of, of the public around nuclear. Um, and uh, you know, I just uh, want more people to know about it, more people to understand how, uh, how you know, how green it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>